Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our Talks with Walt, which we are calling our Reading of Whitman's Leaves of Grass, the Deathbed Edition. And we are now back with, starting from Pomenoc, section number 18, out of 19 sections. So uh, we're obviously coming to the very end. Now, often this uh, little section or poem is called the C section, S-E-E, -E, because of the sum... 18 times that this word gets used, 12 times as first word in that thing we called anaphoria. And then, of course, you have the uh, full number of times that it gets used, 18 times. Now, our assumption is that you've been with us already and at LearnStrong.net, down that left-hand side, Talks with Walt. Make sure, um, hopefully, that you have already been with us for the 24 lectures of inscriptions, the 24 poems of inscriptions, and then as well, the previous 18 sections and the intro section to starting from Pomenoc. Now look, we said at the very beginning, we learn how to read Song of Myself, the heart in many ways of Leaves of Grass, by reading starting from Pomenoc. And we've seen different types of themes that are going to be resurrected. Now we're going to come to another kind of theme or message here. And we're going to point out that great poets, as we often say, great poets will show instead of tell. Now, because this passage is a little bit longer and requires a little bit more thinking for us, I'm going to go ahead and just start with the reading of a line and then the exegeting of that line. But I want to point out right away, think about all of the amazing recent inventions that had happened in Whitman's lifetime. The Rotary Printing Press of 1846 the electric telegraph of 1832, and then the steam locomotive, so amazing, in 1829. All of these things are happening, and we said many times before, and we'll say it again, that Whitman lived in an incredibly dynamic moment in American history, and in some ways he's trying to capture that dynamism. So we'll pay attention now to the scene that he's going to recommend, all of the things that he sees. Now, he goes back so many times to Aristotle. We've already mentioned Aristotle in a couple of our comments on different sections of starting from Pomenoc. In some ways, Whitman himself recognized that he wanted to be the new Aristotle, the new taxonomer. He wanted to be that witness, in some ways, to his time. And so, remember what Aristotle said, what great literature is. You look into it like a mirror and it reflects back to you something that you see of yourself. We're going to see something going on here. And by the way, notice the number of times that we're going to see as well my poems. Five times and then at the conclusion with my songs. That would constitute six. So we're going to see a certain kind of personal rendering in these final poems of 17, 18, and then soon 19. Let's just read now together. C, he's, he began, C, steamers steaming through my poems. So the steam engine and the steamboat one that he, had, that he had gone on as he went down to New Orleans, for example. See in my poems, immigrants continually coming and landing. And Whitman was a great understander of what was happening demographically to America because of the, because of the immigrants. Notice the word here, continually. In other words, America is a land of immigrants. And he himself, of course, understood his own immigrant uh, background. C, in area, that is to say, in the rear, sometimes understood even as a fee, the wigwam. Now, we made our comments already in, in passage 16 of the tragedy that was the passing and the soon-to-be passing of, of Native American culture all over America. In the reference of wigwam, the trail, the hunter's hut, the flat boat. By the way, he's got nine of these things that he's going to list that we're just seeing. The maize leaf, the claim... Think about that one as it relates to displaced native peoples. The rude fence, rude here means simply made. We think of our Thoreau and Whitman and, and, and Walden when we play that game. And the backwards village. Notice all these of or relating to the rural. Now what we're going to see here in this poem is a juxtaposition of what America is. The rural, the country, versus the city or the urbane. Okay? And obviously Whitman spent time in both. He knew both really well. He considered himself as much rule as he was urbane, okay? And so he's going he's to celebrate both. It's continuing now. C, on the one side, and notice it's capitalized, the Western Sea, obviously the Pacific, and on the other, the Eastern Sea, that is to say the Atlantic. In other words, we sit between two seas, right? And how they, the seas, 
advance and retreat. Now this movement of the ocean is for Whitman going to come back again and again in Leaves of Grass. How they advance and retreat upon my poems as upon their own shores. In other words, the movement that Whitman is playing with. And if we sit down and just read, and I challenge you to do this now that we're finishing starting from Pominock, I do challenge you to do this. Just sit down and read aloud. Remember we said that Whitman would want his stuff always read aloud far more than just simply reading it silently. And if you were to sit down and, re and read starting up from Pominock, right from the very first word to the very last word, there's an interesting movement that you would definitely feel that would be best represented here by the advance and the retreat. And now we're back again to the country. See pastures and forests in my poem, see animals wild and tame, where we're, we're going to see both wild and tame, obviously all kinds of things in Lisa Grass. See beyond the call, and again, notice capitalized, taking us back to passage 16, when we had some 15 uh, native tribes that would be listed there. This will constitute us the 16, of course, uh, the Kaw tribe, the great tribe from Oklahoma and uh, the surrounding areas of Kansas and Oklahoma, right? The Kaw, beyond the Kaw, countless herds, now this one's going to break our heart, right? Countless herds of buffalo feeding on short curly grass. Now Whitman didn't want to make distinctions between bison and buffalo that obviously we make out here. But let's just go ahead and call them buffalo, and let's just point out that in 1865 there was an estimated 13 million wild buffalo, and by 1889, one rendering has it at 85 only left, wild buffalo, everything else in captivity. Now that kind of a thing is beyond belief, and yet here it is, notice Whitman calling it countless herds. It's, a, it's, it, it's sad. Notice they're feeding on short curly grass. And we're going to hear more about that grass, obviously, years later in the Great Depression and, of course, the Dust Bowl that would follow because so much of that grass got tilled up. See in my poems, this is the fifth time he's used it, cities, by the way, notice it's plural, poems. In other words, by the deathbed edition, when Whitman has placed this starting from Pominock here at this place in Leaves of Grass, this is still, after the inscription's 24 poems, this is the 24th inscription poem, if you want to think of it that way. That is to say... I'm introducing you to all of Leaves of Grass. That's why, that's why he uses the plural. See in my poems, and now we'll get another listing. Notice, cities, solid, vast, inland. So he's celebrating now not the, not the rural, but the city. And he talks about them as solid. He talks about them as vast. He's going to, uh, obviously, I've already mentioned Chicago earlier. He's going to talk about them as inland, further and further into the country, right? With paved streets, with iron and stone edifices, ceaseless vehicles, and commerce. And of course, today we speak of our cities in very similar kinds of ways. And the word ceaseless is an important word in Lisa Grass. See the mini cylindered steam printing press. That is to say, notice mini cylinders is hyphened, notice printing press is hyphened. Here, of course, 1846, such an important moment. What was the most important invention in the history of America? Well, Whitman would probably say the printing press because, of course, that allowed him to be able to share his leaves of grass with the world. It's hard to say, right? Obviously, the steam engine was a big one as well, right? See the electric telegraph. Was it the telegraph? For those of us who love to play on our phones all the time, you're right. I mean, obviously, the telegraph was the precursor for that kind of thing, right? The electric telegraph stretching across the continent, and the stretching is an important word because we're going to get to the train in a little bit. In other words, America is a... Is a, is a nation that Whitman recognizes that's constantly, constantly expanding, growing, 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 right? Uh, expanding in all kinds of ways. See through Atlanticus. Now here, this is a reference to the fable that Atlantic, uh, Atlantis, the city. Here it's just the, the, the Atlantic Ocean, right? Depths, pulses. We've said this word's important. It's going to be used twice here. Pulses, and then a very strange word that's not hyphenated, a very strange uh, combination. American Europe. Now we got to go back to our Emerson and our study of Emerson at LearnStrong.net to pick up on why there's such irony here of this one. Obviously Europe itself had looked down on America as being somehow lesser. It would be Emerson that would say we need a voice that would speak to the majestic nature of our new America. And obviously Whitman says I'm the guy for your, I'm the guy for your, for your troubles. Reaching is, and again this the stretching before now it's reaching. Reaching pulses of Europe Duly, and then he uses the alighted verb, uh, returned, instead of giving us the ED, it's the hyphen and the D, to give us, a, again, a sense of the American vernacular. In other words, for Whitman, America is 
Europe in extension. In other words, beyond anything European is American, and it's better in the end for Whitman, right? And then he continues. See, the strong and quick locomotive of 1829, of course, right? It changed everything. Some have argued that it was the locomotive that ultimately changed everything about the world because, of course, transportation is ultimately what led to the conquering of the Midwest and the, and the Mountain West, uh, where we live, of course. As it departs, and then he uses a very interesting verb, panting, blowing the steam whistle, again, a hyphenated word, right? This panting, as if it's almost like an animal. And he'll do this a lot in Leaves of Grass, where he'll turn machines into almost like animals of a kind. He gives them some kind of personification, panting here, seeming to suggest like it's waiting, it's ready to go, it's ready to go. And then, sounding very much now like uh, I hear America singing the, the inscriptions poem, see plowmen plowing farms, see miners digging mines, see the numberless factories, of course the Industrial Revolution now is ready to, to really get going, see mechanics busy at their benches with tools, sounding very much like uh, I hear America singing. And then an interesting line, notice by the way the dashes here that will remind us of Emily Dickinson, see from among them, all of, these, all of these workers, right, these mechanics, um, these, uh, these plowmen, these miners, see from among them superior judges, philosophs, presidents, emerge dressed in working dresses. Let's say three things really quickly about this. Notice that for Whitman, and he loved Lincoln as his primary example, he loves that one of the major differences between America and Europe is that the greatest leaders come from the working class. They come from people who start out, like Lincoln, with absolutely nothing and find their way to the positions of most important power. For Whitman, that was a sign that America was different from all things preceding to it. Number two, notice that he talks about superior, and then he gives us three interesting words. Judges. We're going to be a nation of laws. This takes us back, of course, to Virgil's Aeneid and that promise in that famous passage in 6, right? Go back and look at our lecture on it already. In the underworld, that the promise will be that what Rome will give to the world is law. Here, it's the mention of judges. Then it's philosophs. That is to say, of course, our intelligentsia. This is interesting because up to this point, with the exception of Emerson, most people in Europe really didn't think of Americans as being philosophs. And then finally, notice it's capitalized. Presidents emerge and then this idea of dressed in working dresses. I think this is important, number three, to point out, that he says that we're going to define in large measure Americans as what they do and how they dress. And this is significant given that that famous photo of the very first 1855 Leaves of Grass is Whitman dressed very casually as a person of labor, right? C, and then he finishes with one of his favorite, favorite words, lounging through the shops and fields, and there it is, right? The shops are in the city, the fields are obviously in the rural, the country, of the states capitalized me. Now he's going to finish this, uh, this whole poem, starting from Pominach with this word, and then of course he places it right before Song of Myself. Me, and then you have two hyphened words, right? Well beloved, notice the alighted verb, close held by day and night. So in other words, Whitman says, I'm in the middle of all of this, and I'm held close. We're, we're, we're again back to this notion of holding on. And some of this language can sound very sexual, as we pointed out in earlier lectures, right? Beloved, close held by, me, uh, close held by day and night, hear the loud echoes. Go back to our comments of, uh, of passage 11, and of course, our T.S. Eliot, Burt Norton, my words echo thus in your mind. The echoes, loud echoes, of my songs, as opposed to my poems, which takes us to number six there. And then the hyphen, read the hints come at last. And of course, this hints, how many times? I mean, just go back and do a search of how many times the word hints has been used here. That is to say suggestions. That is to say the epistemological fallibilist position. I think I'm right, but I could be wrong. But I think I'm right. And that's this hint. And then notice, come is our is our favorite word of leaves of grass. It's a word that comes up again and again and again, no pun intended. It's the very first word. If you open leaves of grass, deathbed edition in the epigraph, right there it is. The word come is our first word. And then the word at last. In other words, it's finally happening. Of course, ironically, we're also at last, finally, to the very next, to the last poem of uh, our section of starting from Pominock, 19 
full sections, 19 full poems. It's been a challenge for us, obviously, to get here. Let's quickly finish. At 2A, well, obviously, one of the major messages here is that technology equals growth and that the new does replace the old. And for Whitman, that is an inevitability, and it is to be celebrated. At 2B, well, we, we mentioned all these repetitions, the word C 18 times, right? Um, and, and it's fascinating the, the way that it, there's, uh, there's 32 at least specific things that we're supposed to see in this poem. I mean, you go back and count them yourself. I mean, it's, it's, it's more than probably 32. But at least 32 things he says, I want you to pay attention to this, and then pay attention to this, and then I want you to pay attention to this. Notice the dynamism as well to be. The use of the word my poems and then ultimately with my songs, that's six times. So he's coming now to the end. In many ways, we're coming to the end of the introductory set of lines for Leaves of Grass as we begin Song of Myself, which is, of course, as we've said, really in many ways the heart of the, 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 whole, book, the whole book of poems. At 3A, just a couple of observations. One is Sandberg's Chicago, which is, again, the celebration of the city. We've given a full lecture on it at Ernstrong.net. The thing I want to point out here, and this will sound kind of strange at first at 3A, but write it down and go back and take a look at it. Dante's Divine Comedy. Go back and look at all of our lectures on every canto of that, of that poem and think about the number of times that Virgil will say to Dante, see, pointing C, and then Dante the Pilgrim will then tell us as readers what it is that he's seeing. And it plays very similar to the, the way this poem is constructed. Finally, at 3B, which of all of the specific things to see in this set of lines did you like best, and which one did you not like best? Maybe the referencing to Countless Buffalo is going to break all of our hearts as it should. And then finally, what do you think is America? Which is actually America? I mean, this is a fun debate in political uh, um, times when elections come around. There's always this debate. Which is the real America? Is it the urban? Is it the city? Is it the rural? Is it the country? Or is it both? And can it actually be both? Well, let's come back now for section 19 and the conclusion of starting from Pominock and the O poem. Thank you.